I want, to I want to give you a title today, Share Your Story. We're in, a, we're in a place now where the world is hearing a lot of different stories. They need to hear your story. And I, and I don't mean a, a negative story. They need to hear a positive story of what God is doing through you and for you. Share your story. I'm going to encourage you to share your story. Um, now, you don't, you don't even have to, you can share your story in a lot of different vehicles, Facebook and, and uh, Instagram, and give me, give me something else, Twitter, Twitter. you can tweet uh, your story out, you can share with somebody um, close face to face, you can eat together and in your home or social distance and have some coffee. Share your story. God wants to give you a story. Um, he's the miraculous God. It's not just every day. God will do things that, that no one else can do. But you've got to share your story. I, wanna, I, I want to give you some components for that to happen. Because um, when you read the Bible, the Bible is full of extraordinary stories. Extraordinary. And you can read that extraordinary story in like 15 to 20 minutes. But the story didn't happen in 20 minutes. The story was building over time. And God was doing extraordinary things. And in that time, this, those individuals had emotions and thoughts and feelings and up days and down days and uncertainty. But you have to recognize that God is doing the same thing to you, for you. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He wants to give you a great story. There are some principles in building a story. I'm going to walk you through a few of those, not all of them, but a few that we can handle today. Here's the first one is live in unity with God. If you're going to have a story with God, you're going to want to walk in unity with God. Because life is like a journey, and there's twists and turns in it. There's some ups and some downs, some good days, some bad days. There's some stuff you don't understand that's really good, but it feels bad. Come on. But God is, is with you, and you have to make a decision. I'm going to live united with God. I'm going to live my life, the earth suit that he's given me, and I'm going to live as long as I'm here in unity with God. Now listen, when you're first, when you're first born, you may not walk in unity with God because you just don't know him yet, but once you meet him and you get close to him, you need to readjust your entire life so that you're always united with God. I'm always connected to the king. I'm always doing what he wants me to do, going where he wants me to go, honoring what he wants me to honor. I'm connected to the living God. So I live in unity with God. I give in unity with God. I serve in unity with God. I love in unity with God. I sacrifice in unity with God. Live in unity with God. Genesis chapter 17, God has a plan and he's He's working it through his servant Abraham. He meets Abraham when he's Abram and changes his name from father to father of nations, from Abram to Abraham. And Abraham starts this, this, this walk with God, and God has a plan, and he starts to unfold that plan to Abraham about a legacy, about his future. He doesn't know what his future is going to be like, so God breaks it down for him and tells him about it. He has, he has hopes and dreams too, and God begins to speak to his hopes and dreams because that's why he called him, and there's this, there's this unity that comes because God wants to build a great nation so he can bring the Messiah to save all of us. So God talks to Abraham about having a son, and it says in verse 17 of Genesis 17, Abraham fell face down. Then he laughed and said to himself, can I... Can a child be born to a hundred-year-old man? And now your first inclination is, no. That's a, that can't happen. You're too old. Can Sarah, a 90-year-old woman, give birth? 90. This woman is 90 years old, <laughs> has never had a child, and she's going to have one at 90. Live in unity with God. Because God just does extraordinary things anytime he wants to. He is the great God. You should walk in unity with him. You should stay connected to him. So Abraham says to God, 
if only Ishmael were acceptable to you. He has a son from Hagar, this Sarah's handmaiden, her servant, and it's Ishmael. And God says to him, no, your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will name him Isaac. No, I love this about God. Sometimes you're asking him questions. He doesn't negotiate very well. He's in charge. So he wants what he wants. And if you give him what he wants, then he'll use you mightily. You become unstoppable. So he wants, but he hears Abraham, and he understands what Abraham's desire is. So he says, no, I'm, gonna, I'm doing something. I will confirm my covenant with him as a permanent covenant for his future offspring. As for Ishmael, I've heard you. I hear you. I feel you. I know what's in your heart. I know your desires. I know what you want to see happen tomorrow. Here's, here's what I want, but because you're united with me, I will bless him. Because you walk with me, I will make him fruitful and will multiply him greatly. He will father 12 tribal leaders and I will make him into a great nation. But I will confirm my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this time next year. Now, Sarah's not here at this conversation. So Abraham's got to go home and say, girl, I know you're 90, but by this time next year, you're going to have a child. And Sarah, I wasn't there when he said that to her, but I can, but I am married. So Sarah kind of halves, half believes him, half doesn't. Kind of looks at Abraham and say, oh, yeah. So in Genesis 18, it picks the story up again where God has intervened in their life. Genesis 18, 9, it says, where is your, where is your wife, Sarah? He has changed, flipped her from Sarah to Sarah. Sarah means princess. So he's now made her a princess. She's still barren. She's 90 years old, but God has a plan, and he's executing his plan through a couple that lives united with him. Where is Sarah? There, there in the tent, Abram answered, or Abraham. The Lord said, I will certainly come back to you in about a year's time, and your wife Sarah will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent behind him, Abraham and Sarah were old and getting on in years. Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Uh, listen, can I say this to some of you that are at an advanced age? You're not done. If the enemy has convinced you that you're done, he's a liar. You're not done. I'm going to tell you the truth that God has plenty of things, great things, mighty things still for you to do. Don't let the pain in your body fool you. Don't let the discomfort mess your mind up. Don't let the enemy measure your life now based on, on what you haven't done when God's going to measure you based on the great things you have done. And you're not finished yet. We're going to do some extraordinary things in this hour. Sarah's listening at the entrance of the tent behind him. And Abraham and Sarah were old and getting on in years, as we just read. So she laughed to herself. After I am worn out and my Lord is old, she had to get Abraham in there. Will I have delight? Am I actually going to be able to produce a child? When I've been praying for a child all my life, I've been, I've been asking and petitioning all my life. Listen, the timetable of God and the timetable of man are often different. But if you will stay the course, 
and stay united, you'll find that God will fulfill the desires of your heart that are his desires. So Sarah laughed to herself. But the Lord asked Abraham, why does Sarah laugh, saying, can I really have a baby when I'm old? Is anything impossible for the Lord? Can you answer that for me? I'm gonna, I want to hear you say, give me an answer. And if you're online, I want you to give me an answer too. Is anything impossible to the Lord? No. no. The, it's the Lord asking the question. It's not Abraham making, or it's not a writer making a, uh, a historical mark. It's the Lord himself, because she's laughing. What is she laughing about? She wasn't laughing with joy. She was la laughing because of unbelief. She was saying, there's, I, it's, not a, I'm, it's, not a, it's not a bad thing against her. It's just a human emotion. It's a human emotion when God comes and says, by this time, and I'm going to do so-and-so for you, and you've never had that, you're going to go, Okay, I mean, okay, I mean, what are the chances? 100%. So the Lord asked, why did Sarah laugh, saying, can I really have a baby when I'm old? Is there anything impossible for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will come back to you, and in about a year, she will have a son. Sarah denied it. I did not laugh, she said, because she was afraid. But he replied, no. You did laugh. Here's what I love about God. He's, he always lives in the truth. Always lives in the truth. You might as well live in the truth. If you do something stupid and somebody says, what, what did you do? Don't say nothing. <laughs> live in the truth. Well, I'm not going to say that. That's embarrassing to me. Yeah, pull your pants down to public so he doesn't have to do it for you. I'm just, I mean that. Once you get your pants pulled down enough times of embarrassing yourself through your foolish behavior, you will stop foolish behavior. The challenge we have right now with our whole culture is we excuse everything that somebody does and they're not accountable. Oh, they had a bad life. Oh, it's because they're a woman. Oh, it's because they're a man. It's because of the color of their skin. It's because of this. It's because the dude just doesn't, refuses to do it. Get a job, man. I can't get a job. Everybody, there's a lot of people. I know it's tough getting a job, but you can get one. But you may not get the job you like. Come on. But as a believer, you should always lead. Lead through your unity with God. Now, Sarah's afraid, so she says, I didn't say it. But God's not going to allow that to go past. He's going to say, yeah, you did. I'm not crushing you for saying it. But don't make like you didn't say it. You said it. And nothing's impossible for me. And I'm not making a statement about you, Sarah, right here. I'm writing a story for the ages. I'm doing something extraordinary through you, for the ages. God is here now in Seattle, Washington with us, has brought us here together for a movement for the ages. Let me, let me encourage you in these things. Don't allow the promises to dilute your faith in God's promise. Don't allow the process, let me say it right, don't allow the process. There's things that don't feel good, but if you don't let the process dilute your faith in God, Loot your faith in God's promises, you will experience the promises of God. You can disqualify yourself, but why would you? Why should you? Trust the promise and he who made it. Who promised me this? Is this God? Because nothing's impossible to him. And that promise will certainly come to pass. God has given you promises. He's given you promises in his word. He's given you promises in your, in your prayer time. He's given you promises in your life. Why do you act like you have no promises? Why do you act like the process is greater than the promise? And the God that you're serving cannot do that which he said he's going to do in your own house. 
The process can mess with you. The process can be an antagonist. If you'll stay the course with God, you will overcome. But if you fail to do so, you can annul the promise both individually and corporately. The scriptures are full of the nation of Israel as they're going to their journey, putting themselves back through rebellion. Making a bad decision, then they, they wait. God wants to take them into the promised land, they can't go, so they have to wait. Then they come to a place where, where they, they're just not going back. They're going back to Egypt now. And so God says, enough of that. I'm going to kill all of these rascals who don't trust me. And I'm going to bring their children into the promised land. And so in a moment, he annuls the promise to them and passes it into their children because they refuse to trust God. So the nation still goes on year after year, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, 35 years. It's 40 years later. Some of them are just waiting. They're ready to go into their promise, but they're waiting for the last guy to die. Hey, dude, how you doing? You feeling good? Feeling bad? You got a cold? You're dying? <laughs> Won't be long now. Won't be long. Because this guy won't live united. Live united. Let me give you a few antagonists to being faithful and walking unity with God. Uh, time delays. When there's a, de a time delay, when you think something should happen by this time, and by this time it hasn't happened, that time delay can attack your trust and your faith in God. Be aware of that. That's a human emotion. You got time delays. Well, by this time, and this is never going to happen. If you've ever said that to yourself, this is never going to happen. I don't understand why that's happening. This is never going to Stop that. Stop that. God can do anything at any time. Is anything impossible? So a time delay. As a human being, you have this time delay. It'll mess with your mind. Fear. When you're afraid. When you're afraid, I'm telling you what, it will, it will set back your relationship with God. Because he doesn't live in fear. He has no fear. There is no fear in God. Perfect love, cast out, all fear. Don't, don't live in fear. Rebellion. When God gives you something to do and you just refuse to do it because you don't want to do it. It's rebellion. I'm just telling you what, sometimes the small little things, he'll say, come on. It's just gonna... When I was a kid growing up with my mom, single mom, my mom would ask me to do something. I'd say, mom. And she would just kind of like pat me. Like, come on. Come on, son. Get done what you need to get done. Get up. Get up. You got to go to school. Get up. She would just come. Just come do that. She would sometimes clap her hand, and, and if I didn't respond to that little clap like that, she would just pop me in. Hey, 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 hey. Come on. She wouldn't beat me, but she was, she was making me wake up. Wake up. Come on. Come on. I think sometimes the Lord is, you get into a relationship with God, and you just refuse. You just, I'm just, you're stuck. You don't, you keep going back to that, and you say, hey, 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 hey. Come on, come on, I'm breaking down this. I'm not allowing that. I'm telling you, because I'm going to get your attention now, because i got a great plan for you. And I'm going to do extraordinary things to your life. And you're just getting just halfway sleepy, and you don't, you're not ready. Get up and pray some. Get up and do what you're supposed to do. I'm going to take that away from you. I broke that TV down because you spent too many hours doing that. You need to come on. Come on, boy. There's more for you. There's more in this life. Come on. Sometimes God is just in a place we're trying to move you to the next level so you can share your story because he wants to give you, he wants to do something great through you. Yeah. Don't let rebellion and sin nullify that which God is trying to do. Turn me to Genesis chapter 15. We'll roll back a little bit. I want to give you a little bit of a, of a picture before this happened why God is dealing with him because he wants to live in unity. Abraham, Genesis 15, 6, it says, Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. God has made a plan. He's going to launch it into the future. Now, I want you to know sometimes life can be hard before it becomes easy. You got to be okay with that. Life can be hard before it becomes easier. This is so hard. Yeah. 
I don't believe I can't make it. You can. I just feel like I'm going to die. You're not. We just don't have anything. We'll never have anything. That's not true. It's true you don't have anything, but it's not true you're not going to have something. You have God. He's with you. Well, if he was with me, why is this going on? Because life is hard. In a corrupt environment, life is hard. And don't let the process and the promise be the same. It should only be the same to God. With God, the process and the promise are the same. Because when he issues a promise, the process can't nullify the promise. Only you can nullify the promise. Only unfaithfulness nullifies the promise. Only rebellion nullifies a promise. But when God gives you a promise, he's not concerned with the process. It might take three months. It might take 30 months. It might take 30 years. But his promise is alive. And life can be hard before it becomes easy. So here's Abraham. And he's not Abraham yet. He's still Abram. And God makes his promise, and he says to him in verse 7, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, Lord God, how can I know that I will possess it? And he said to him, bring me a three-year-old cow, a three-year-old goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. So he brought all, all these to him, cut them in half, and laid the pieces opposite each other. What's he doing? He's preparing the elements for a covenant. For a covenant is a bond that cannot be broken. And he, but he did not cut the birds. And the birds of prey came down on the carcass, but Abram drove them away. So he has the elements to enter covenant with God. He set those things. God calls him to get those. He gets them, sets those things in order. But before God comes, shows up, there's some time delay. And in the time delay, an adversary comes to destroy that, the elements of the covenant. And Abram has to fight for this covenant relationship. And there's going to be times that you're going to have to draw your sword and fight the enemy to establish your relationship with God. There's going to be times that God offers, the enemy comes and offers you something. Hey, man, look at this. Drink this. Smoke this. Go do this. If you, if that God really cared, he wouldn't have this emotional and uncertainty with you, and you should do. Don't listen to that liar. You're going to have to fight sometimes for the things, not just the covenant, but the things that establish God's covenant. There's going to be times you have to get up in the morning and come to church. I'm watching at the house. You're not watching at the house. You got it on, but you're not listening. You're in there eating snacks in the kitchen. (laughs) Playing video games on your phone. (laughs) I have kids. We have to stay the course. So he cut these, the animals, and he's ready for this covenant. Watch this. Birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abraham, Abram drew, drove them away. And the sun was setting, verse 12, and a deep sleep came over Abram. And suddenly great terror and darkness descended on him. Listen, sometimes we anticipate it to be really sweet and good and kind. And the birds are singing and everybody's happy and But there's times, man, when you're walking with God and the presence of God is there, that it's scary. This is hard. (sighs) And there's terror and uncertainty. It's okay. You're not alone. The Lord's with you. I can go back into my own journey, my own story, the times I didn't think I was going to make it. I just said, Lord, I would repent all the time. And the Lord would say, stop. Stop repenting. The blood of Jesus has already settled that. Have faith in me. But I had more confidence in my failure than I had faith in God's promise. Don't have more confidence in your failures. Trust God. He's already restored you. (laughs) Then the Lord said to Abram, know this for certain. Your offspring will will be resident aliens for 400 years. Can somebody say 400 years? 400 years. 400 years in a land that does not belong to them. 
and will be enslaved and oppressed. Listen, how about this for a covenant? We're going to enter a covenant, but I'm going to tell you about 400 years. There's going to be some slavery and oppression and a struggle for 400 years for your people. Are you good with that? He's got to be all right with that. Why does he have to be all right with it? Because it's going to sell his heart. Not doesn't going to change God. God's going to establish what he's already established. But he knows. He's teaching him. He's showing him. However, I will judge the nation they serve. And afterward, they will go out with many possessions. I'm going to make them rich and powerful. But you will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. I'm going to, I'm going to fulfill this in the future, but I'm going to bless you right now. Strengthen you and tell you about your life. In the fourth generation, they will return here for the iniquity of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. And what does that mean? That means I have a plan, but I can't just execute the plan without justice. That God is a just God. And he will always do things that are just at the time appointed. And I cannot judge this nation and supplant them, take them out without them demonstrating to the universe that they deserve to be supplanted. That they're not righteous. Sometimes you can look at something and say, that's not right. And those people always get over, hey, where's God? Where are you going to do something? He's going to do something at the time appointed. Yeah, that's good. That's good. What you need to do is stay in line with him. Stay in unity with him. Don't get ahead of him. God, I demand, I, I demand this. I'm, I'm just a good. Stop that. Put that down. And go and pray. And just do what God's called you to do. Because that's going to happen at the time of appointed because he reigns forever. So they, they cut the elements. They divide the animals. And on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and Abram saying, I give you this land to you and your offspring from the brook of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Canaanites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the land of the Ites. And they take it. They take that whole territory. And all becomes the nation of Israel. Let me close with this. In John chapter 11, verse, verse 20, it tells a story of, of Jesus interacting with Martha and Mary and and their brother Lazarus has died. And in verse 20 it says, as, as soon as Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she, she went to meet him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Then Martha said to Jesus, watch this, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Yet even now I know that whatever you ask God, God will give you. And Jesus says, your brother will rise again. And Martha said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. The word resurrection means to, to stand up again, to stand up again, to resurrect, to, st to stand up again, to, to go from death back to life. And so Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. I, am, I, I give you the power to stand up again, and I give you zoe. Zoe is, this word life translated zoe, is the highest quality of living that there is no higher quality of living. It's the fullness of the best that God has for you. I am in me. In me is the resurrection, the anastasis, and the zoe, the life of God. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said, yes, Lord. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who comes into the world. Having said this, she went back and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and calling for you. And as soon as Mary heard this, boom, she's out. So she quickly uh, went to him. Jesus had not yet come into the village, but still in, was still in the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw that Mary got up quickly and went out. They followed her, supposing that she had gone to the tomb to cry. And as soon as Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and told him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her crying and the Jews who had come with her crying, he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. 
And where have you put him? He said, Lord, they told him, come and see. And Jesus wept. You know the rest of the story. Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. And I, I'm going to say this to you. If, if you're going to have resurrection, if you're going to stand up again in life, in this hour, if you're going to rebuild something extraordinary in this hour, if you're going to do things that has never been done before, you've got to be all in. You have to be fully devoted and all in to experience the resurrection power to stand up again. You can't be partial. You can't be kind of. You can't be interpreting and doing what you want to do. You can't get drunk on Friday and then come repent on Sunday. You've got to be all in. You've got to be a, at some point in time, you've got to just say, listen, you know what? It's all about Yeshua. And I'm all in. I'm not, I'm not interested in just being partial. I'm all in. You know, there's, there's two things that have happened here, and I'm just going to point them out, and then we'll close. They say the same thing to Jesus. If you had have been here, my brother would not have died. But when Martha says it, she says it to Jesus in a conversation. When Mary says it, she says it to Jesus as she's worshiping on her face. What Jesus says to Martha is, where's Mary? Where's Mary? Is she still around here? Is she back at the house? Where's Mary? If you would have been here, Jesus. Yeah, yeah, I understand. I am the resurrection, though. I am the stand up again. There's nothing I can't do. Where's Mary? Where's she? So they go get her, and then Mary... Mary comes and she falls at his feet. And then he says to Mary, where's Lazarus? Where's your issue? Where's your struggle? Let me, let me, let me overcome it. Let me give you the power to stand up again. Same words, different results from a different spirit. Let's get all in, man. Let this be a season that you just step all in. Everything, anything you want, God, I'm in. Father, we know that you're the miracle worker. There's nothing you can't do. And we want to be all in. But we have to meet us where we are and take us to where you want us to be. We know we can't do it by ourselves, but, but you're the great God. No one like you, God. Be extraordinary to us according to your way. It's not my decision for you. It's your decision for you. God wants to give you a story. He wants to do incredible things do for your life right now, for your household, for your children and your children's children, to give you a husband or a wife and do grand things. Come in agreement with him. Trust him. Well, you know, Pastor G, I'm kind of old now. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I really don't, people don't like me and I don't like them. Is anything too hard to change your attitude, behavior? Can God not show up and do extraordinary things? Even through you? Even now? Of course he can. And he will because nothing's impossible for him.